My name is Lucy. I work as a pharmacist, and I thought I had a pretty ordinary, happy life. That changed the moment my husband, Ethan, brought his younger sister, Julia, to live with us without even asking me. We had just moved into my late grandfather's house, a place filled with memories that was both comforting and bittersweet for me. I had just lost my grandfather and was still emotionally drained from his passing. Instead of allowing me some peace, Ethan decided to invite Julia over, claiming, The house is large and just the two of us would be too lonely. It's better if Julia moves in. Julia's arrival wasn't just unexpected. It felt like an invasion. Her attitude only made things worse. She acted like she was doing me a favor by being there, making snide remarks and turning Ethan against me when I tried to express my discomfort. She constantly belittled me when we were alone. You should dress more fashionably, Lucy. Aren't you making enough money as a pharmacist? Or worse? My brother used to date women who looked like models. You seem so plain in comparison. The first time Julia invited herself over without warning, I tried to be polite. She brought her friends, claiming, the cafe was crowded so we thought we'd have lunch here. I didn't know how to react, but I managed to ask them to leave calmly. When Ethan found out, he berated me for embarrassing his sister. It was shocking. How could he not see how wrong it was for her to intrude like that? Things started to change, subtly at first. Ethan, who had once been attentive and shared household responsibilities, became distant. He started neglecting chores, leaving his things everywhere, while still coddling Julia. She, in turn, became even more brazen. She openly mocked my cooking in front of Ethan, suggesting that I was purposely doing a bad job. He laughed along with her, dismissing my feelings entirely. The breaking point came when Ethan moved Julia into the house without telling me. He said, From now on, the three of us will live here. It's too sad to leave Julia alone in her apartment. He ignored my protests. When I finally pushed back, suggesting that we needed to discuss major decisions together, Ethan snapped, If you don't like it, maybe you should be the one to leave. The shock of hearing my own husband tell me to leave my grandfather's house, the home that I inherited, left me numb. I knew I had to protect myself. Ethan had changed, or maybe I was just seeing who he really was for the first time. And Julia? She was not just immature, she was manipulative. I started paying closer attention, and soon enough, I learned the full extent of her plans. One night, when Ethan stayed out late, I decided to visit a nearby pub with some friends. There, by sheer coincidence, I overheard Julia talking with her boyfriend. She was drunk, bragging about how she was going to get the house, how Ethan would do anything she asked, and how she planned to eventually push him out too so she could live there with her boyfriend. I recorded the conversation, every word of it. The next day, when Ethan tried to confront me over another of Julia's fabricated stories, I calmly played the recording. The color drained from his face as Julia's voice echoed through the room, detailing her manipulative plans and her disdain for both of us. Julia tried to deny it, accusing me of fabricating the recording, but her panicked expression gave her away. Ethan stood there, silent and stunned, as the reality of his sister's betrayal sank in. I want a divorce, I told Ethan. He tried to protest, to convince me that he had just been deceived, that we could work things out. But I was done. There was nothing left to salvage. The love I once felt had been eroded by his blind loyalty to Julia and his utter disregard for me. I left that day, taking only what I needed. The divorce went through smoothly. Ethan even had the papers ready, as if he had expected it all along. Afterward, Ethan and Julia tried to stay in my grandfather's house, but legally, they had no claim. My lawyer made sure of that. They were forced to leave, and soon enough, their lives began to unravel. Without my financial stability, Ethan struggled. Julia, too, faced her own consequences, dropping out of college and taking on menial work just to get by. As for me, I found peace. I stayed in my grandfather's house, surrounded by memories of someone who had truly loved me. I began hosting small gatherings, filling the home with warmth and laughter once more. It wasn't the life I had imagined when I first married Ethan, but it was mine, and it was happy. Despite everything, I couldn't help but feel a sense of closure as I rebuilt my life.
My friends came by often, and the house that once felt empty was now filled with laughter and new beginnings. I found joy in the little things, decorating the garden, cooking meals for my friends, and enjoying the tranquility that came with being free from all the drama. The nights were quiet, and for the first time in a long while, I could sleep without feeling the weight of someone else's expectations pressing down on me. I also focused on my work. Being a pharmacist had always been a passion of mine, and throwing myself into my job helped me heal. My colleagues were supportive, often inviting me out after work. I started to feel like myself again, a version of myself that wasn't constantly worrying about pleasing someone else or trying to keep the peace in my own home. One day, I received a letter from Ethan. It was apologetic, full of regret and excuses. He claimed that he had been blinded by his love for his sister, that he never intended for things to get so out of hand. He asked if we could meet, if there was any chance we could start over. I read the letter carefully, but I knew my answer before I even finished. I didn't want to go back, not to him, not to that life. I had moved on, and I was finally happy. I wrote back, politely declining his request. I wished him well and hoped that he would find his own path forward. It wasn't easy to let go of the person I had once loved, but I knew it was the right thing to do. Ethan had made his choices, and I had made mine. There was no going back. Julia, on the other hand, tried to contact me several times. Her messages were less apologetic and more desperate. She blamed me for everything that had gone wrong in her life, for losing her apartment, for having to drop out of college, for the menial job she now held. I never responded. I knew there was no point. Julia was not someone who would take responsibility for her own actions, and I had no interest in reopening that chapter of my life. Months passed, and the seasons changed. I spent more time outdoors, tending to the garden my grandfather had once loved. It was therapeutic, watching things grow, nurturing life in a way that felt meaningful. My friends often joined me, and we would sit outside for hours, talking and laughing as the sun set over the horizon. The house, once a place of sadness and tension, had become a haven, a place where I could be myself, free from the shadows of my past. One evening, as I was preparing dinner, I received a call from my former mother-in-law. She was apologetic, explaining that she had only just learned the full extent of what had happened between Ethan, Julia, and me. She expressed her regret for not stepping in sooner, for not recognizing the toxicity of the situation. I could hear the pain in her voice, the disappointment she felt in her own children. I assured her that it was all in the past, that I held no ill will toward her. She had always been kind to me, and I wanted her to know that I appreciated her reaching out. After the call, I sat down at the kitchen table, looking around the house that had become my sanctuary. I thought about everything that had happened, the love, the betrayal, the heartbreak, and finally, the freedom. It had been a long journey, but I had found my way through it. I had found peace, not just in my surroundings, but within myself. I decided to throw a party to celebrate the new chapter of my life. I invited my friends, my colleagues, and even a few neighbors I had gotten to know over the past few months. The house was filled with people, with music, with laughter. As I looked around at the smiling faces, I realized that this was what I had been missing all along, a sense of belonging, of community, of genuine happiness. That night, as the party wound down and my friends began to leave, one of my colleagues pulled me aside. He had been a good friend to me since the divorce, always offering a listening ear and a kind word. He smiled at me, a genuine warm smile, and said, You know, Lucy, you seem truly happy now. It's like a weight has been lifted off your shoulders. I nodded, feeling the truth of his words deep in my heart. I am happy, I replied. For the first time in a long time, I really am. As I watched the last of my guests leave and close the door behind them, I felt a sense of contentment wash over me. My life wasn't perfect, and there were still challenges ahead, but I knew I could face them. I had found my strength, my voice, and my peace. And that was enough. I walked through the house, turning off the lights and tidying up as I went. I paused by the old family photographs that lined the hallway, smiling at the memories they held. My grandfather's smiling face looked back at me, 
and I felt a warmth in my chest, a reminder that I was never truly alone. I had my memories, my friends, and most importantly, myself. As I climbed into bed that night, I looked out the window at the stars shining brightly in the sky. I took a deep breath, feeling the cool night air fill my lungs and closed my eyes. I was ready for whatever came next, ready to embrace the future, whatever it held. I had found my way back to myself, and that was all I needed to keep moving forward.